And it's out of the message tonight, it's Crossroads. We've all come to a place in our life that uh, we have to make a decision. Uh, and I pray that each one of you that has to make decisions does it because you have a relationship with Jesus. And the outcome is what God wants in your life. But if you're making a decision apart from God, uh, you're making it in a worldly decision. There's no thought process back to the uh, authority in your life. So uh, I just want to talk about some things that we've done in the past weeks and to lead up to this, this crossroads. Because going through Celebrate Recovery, I have, um, uh, I've learned a whole lot going through this. And I see what Brother Joey has been telling me uh, about going through these, preaching through these sermons and, and what it does to you. And I had to go back and look at these crossroads about tonight. Um, if you go back, in, in several weeks, you go back and uh, principle 5 says, Voluntary, voluntarily submit to every change God wants to make in my life and humbly ask Him to remove my character defects. How many of us really have voluntarily submitted to every change God wants to make in my life? Voluntarily. Every change that God wants to make in your life. And, and, and we keep going here in verses of uh, Matthew 5, verse 6. It says, Happy are those whose greatest desire is to do what God requires. You're not going to have any happiness uh, if you're not doing what God is requiring of you. It's very hard that we... We suffer in ourselves because of the decisions that we make. And it gets harder and harder, and then we get callous because of it, and then we don't even, it don't even bother us anymore because our moral compass is so far off that it, it just don't make any sense anymore. I've gone too far and I can't come back. And it becomes your heart, uh, your heart becomes hardened. And here it says, Be ready, willing, and hand over control of your life to Jesus. Making a moral inventory to change uh, aspects of your life. Having victory by making amends and forgiving the ones that have been uh, I, that you have identified that has come against you or you against them. All these are steps and things that we've been going through since I've been preaching in, on Wednesday nights. And tonight, uh, I'm going to tell you, if you have matched up each one of these steps and you're going through these principles and these lessons... I want you to keep going. Don't stop now. It's, it's, you're at a crossroad. And if you, don't, if you don't go on through this crossroad in the right way, you, there's, a, there's a chance that it's not going to be good. And there's a chance that you'll revert right back to the way it was. That's how important it is to stay in God's Word. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. And uh, uh, you've got to keep going. You, you will come to a crossroad and you will have to make a decision. Regardless if it's about salvation, regardless if it's about going back into dependency on drugs or alcohol, or a, 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 an attitude that you did not need to have in your life, uh, whether it's, it's, it's unforgiveness in your life, or things that, that have came in between you and your family, whatever it is, you have to make a decision on which way to go. So uh, what will it be? Is it going to be your way or God's way? Well, tonight if we look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 through 16, I want to read those uh, just for our, our, our scripture uh, reading tonight. If you would, let's stand to read God's Word. Uh, and the book of Nehemiah, nobody knows where this came from. In the book of Nehemiah, uh, uh, the uh, Ezra, the priest, came out and he brought the, the scriptures, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, what Moses had written. He brought those out and he started to read those things at daylight. People stood while he read those words till past noon. And then as they, they looked at these words and the things that everybody in the congregation that understood it talked to other people to help them understand God's Word. That's why we stand in reverence of God's Word because He is holy and He deserves it. Okay? So tonight, if you got that, let's look at 2 Timothy 3, 14-16. It says, but you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, 
for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And verse 17 says that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Let's pray. Lord, I thank You for Your words tonight. I thank You for Your, your words to us, Lord, that You can comfort us uh, through, through Paul. Lord, that he's pinned those down, sending a letter to Timothy, Lord, to, to remind him who You are and, Lord, what Your Word does. Lord, thank You for this tonight. And I pray, Lord, tonight, if we have decisions to make and we're standing at a crossroad, Lord, that we would make the godly decision. Lord, let us, let us see the light tonight in, in Your Word and in Your way that Your way is better than ours. Lord, I pray for those that are here tonight, Lord, that are, that are standing at that, at that crossroad. Lord, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. First point there, it says you must know your destination. You must know your destination. And I get that. As it says, but you must continue in the things which you have learned. You must know your destination. He's already learned some things here. Paul's telling him that Timothy... Was, uh, was raised up by his mom and his grandmother Eunice and uh, they taught him the Word of God. It was very important to them. So Timothy had a background of knowing God's Word. Well, when Paul came, he identified Timothy and seen him and uh, the, the Scriptures never say if they led him to Jesus or not or, or uh, what had happened in that aspect, but somewhere at one time, Timothy was, is a child of God and, and Paul seen promise in him and he wanted to use him. And Timothy was willing and that's one of the things in our steps that we have to be willing that, that we will repent. Willing that God can use us and say, yes, Lord, I'll do what you need me to do. And I'll be in your will and your way. So you need to know your destination to make the right choice. If you're standing uh, at the crossroad, and there's, there's two ways. Okay, Either you can turn or you can go on. And it, it's according to your view of how you make a decision, and it's either going to be a worldly view that you base your decision on, or it's going to be a heavenly view. Now, which one do you think is the best view? Heavenly view. I, I don't think there'd be a person in here who would probably say that a worldly view would probably be okay. Everybody with those two choices would say a heavenly view. And, and I think, you know, 99%, kind of like a Lysol, kills 99.99%. Uh, of, of all bacteria and all that sorts of stuff, there's always going to be something that you can't say 100%. So in, in that, what, what is your view? And uh, where are you going? You must know your destination. Now, in Celebrate Recovery, in, in, in regular church, whatever you're in, okay, this is across the board. These are the questions, these are some things that I thought of that where people come to in their relationship with Jesus. Okay, whether it's at arm's length or I'm just using Jesus to get by. This is what people say. Uh, I'll be at church till I just get sober. And then I'm out. I'll be at church till I get clean. Or I'll be at church till I get my kids back. Or I'll just be at church till I get my life back. Or I'll just, I'll just be at church till I get me a new job. Or I'll just be at church till I make some new friends. What are we using the Word of God in His house for? Are we using it as, as something that, that, that we can just pass through and, and it's like gathering flowers and we just pull out of that church and we just stick it in our bucket and we keep going? Or are we really wanting a relationship with Jesus Christ that He would so change our life that we don't care about anything else but what God wants in our life? Your desires should be changing. The desires of, 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 of what you once were and who you were, once was, they should be changing because you have immersed yourself in God's Word. God's Word will change you. If you do not believe it, you better start reading it. If you have not been changed in the way that you think you should or you're like someone else, you need to ask them why they've changed. And you know what? The very first thing, whenever I have... Have uh, had thoughts. Uh, I have a, I have a routine now, okay, and, and it's discipline. And, and, and sometimes I don't have a really good discipline when I'm at the, at the at the food table. But the the discipline to read God's word, he he wants us to have time with Him every day. Yes, Amen. Whenever we're with God every day in that time, guess what He's doing? 
As we are pouring ourselves into Him, He's filling us up. Amen. We're listening, we're meditating on God's Word, and when we get that, guess what it does? His truths start to bleed out inside of our lives. So when we make decisions, it's godly decisions. Yes. So, uh, if you know where you're going and, and it's heaven, where, what is it? It's knowing heaven is your final destination. Your destination, needs to, you need to know where you're headed. Because that will determine whether you're looking at it with a worldly view or a heavenly view. If you know your final destination is heaven, the things that you're doing, the decisions that you're making, guess what? You're going you're gonna to run across God's table first. Right. You're going to go to Him for it. You're going to go Him with it. And you're going to listen for Him to answer. Because it said, I, I wrote down here, it says, Knowing heaven is your final destination, your present choices should be of a heavenly directive. Amen. I'm going to read that again. Knowing heaven is your final destination, your present choices should be of a heavenly directive. Directive. Now I'm going to go back to this worldly view and this heavenly view for one second. When I was making choices before I came to Christ, I was a church member. You know, I was making good choices, I thought. But there's a very different, there's a very different mindset of a good decision and a godly decision. A godly decision takes into account of what he wants. A good decision takes into account of what I want. Now that's the difference between my sinfulness and His righteousness. Which decision would you rather have and rather make? The one in your sinfulness or the one in His righteousness? Now when I put it that way, man, it sounds like, man, if I'm not making decisions in God's way, something's wrong with me. Well, you know what it is. It, it, it's the sin that so easily ensnares us and it sometimes has an effect on us that we don't want to make the right decision. Because we want what we want. We're very selfish. And until that fruit of the Spirit, is, as Barry was talking about a little bit ago, that fruit of the Spirit is called self-control. When that one right there comes about, selfishness goes out the window. Because then you're looking at it with a heavenly view and not a worldly view. A worldly view, I'm, I'm selfish. I'm selfish. I still am in some parts. I'm selfish. I want what Adam wants. But I have to look through the eyes of, of, of Jesus here and see what He wants. And it's through that heavenly view. And it's self-control. You know why? Because I see what the Bible says when I don't do what He tells me to do. You know, it's not like God's not spoke on those things. One of the first verses that I had memorized in the Bible was John 14, 21. It says, He who has my commands and obeys them, they are the ones that love me. Man, you're like, wow. And you know what I've seen that as? I've seen that as me taking my Bible, going in and out of the church building every Sunday and Wednesday, going to revivals, going with my pastor to, to some uh, tent revivals and some pastor meetings even. And I carried my Bible, and when I first understood and looked at that verse and memorized it, He who has my commands. He who has my commands. And I told you, inside the church, outside the church, I put it on the shelf at the house. I wasn't breaking it open during the week and looking at God's Word saying, hey, I need, I need to know what's going on. Why? Because I had that word of view. But He who has my commands and obeys them, they are the ones that love me. I had His command with me all the time, but what did I not do? I didn't ever obey them. How many times do we walk in and out of this place wanting to make a change, and we have what the change is in our hand, but we never make the change? This is the crossroad that I'm talking about that, that, that is in, in recovery. If we do not take the step to follow through and do what God wants us to do, we're just saying, you know what? I was just here till I got things that I wanted straightened up. You know what? The people that, that I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying just the people here on Wednesday night. I'm saying the people here on Sunday. This message is for everybody. Yes, I'm not picking and choosing. God wants you to be in fellowship with Him through His Son Jesus, Amen. and in that. Sin has to go away. You know why? Sin can go away. 
Because Jesus died for that. He died for the forgiveness of sin that, that we can be forgiven, but we have to repent. We have to see ourselves as apart from God. And that means that we're sinful. So when we see that we're sinful, God made a way that we could get that out of the way and to get in the way. So why would we not want to be in the way? Why would we not want what God wants for us? Why would we not want to follow His commandments? Very simple. Because we love our sin more than we love Jesus. Amen. That's a hard pill to swallow. It is. It is. I'm, I'm going to tell you why. Because I don't want nobody calling me out for what I really am. This may be harsh tonight, but I want to get someone's attention. If we're not reading God's Word, we're not doing what He's told us to do. Amen. If we're not following through and being in His fellowship... And fellowship is not something you do in the hall. Fellowship is something you do between another person and you talk about your God stories back and forth. If you go to Acts chapter 2, the breaking of bread and fellowship was two separate things. So when you can fellowship, that means I'm going to share my quiet time with you. I'm going to share what God's doing in my life. And guess what else I'm going to do? I'm going to share some of my struggles. And I'm going to ask my, my, my friends to pray for me. The Bible even says if you confess your sins to your, to your brothers, you'll be healed. Do you know why we can't get healing in the church nowadays? Because we want to ride around, we want to walk around and let everybody know that we ain't got no problems. Don't, don't wear that hat. There's no reason to. You know why? Because my Bible's done told me that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all sinners. We ain't got it figured out. If we did, we wouldn't have needed Jesus. You've got to know your destination. And when you know your destination, guess what happens? You, you need to know your destination. Who do you say you are now? Who are you? Who are you? In verse 15 in the scripture that we read, it says, And that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Just because he knew the Scriptures when he was young does not mean he was automatically saved. It says right here, it says, That from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation. There is a, there is a uh, verse here, and I want, to, I want everybody, if, if you have your Bible, to look it up. It's Proverbs 22, 6. Proverbs 22, 6. Proverbs 22. Proverbs 22, 6. Now, I have just said, verse 15 is talking about uh, Timothy had known the Scriptures from childhood. And just because he knew Scriptures from childhood did not automatically mean that he was saved. But it enabled him to see the salvation of God so he could put his faith in Christ Jesus. Now, in Proverbs 22, 6, this is what it says. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now then, i got a couple of things that I want to touch. How many in here had a parent that taught you the Scriptures? Okay? I think by the raising of those hands, we probably had more people that their parents did not teach them the Scriptures than we do with people that said their parents taught them the Scriptures. This verse is not about the children. It says train up a child. Who's supposed to be training them? The church? How many hours a week does the church have with your child? 
Lord. If you come every Sunday for a month, every Wednesday for a month, Sunday, let's say your child has two hours, and on Wednesday they have one hour. Three hours a week with four weeks. What is that? Twelve hours a week. I mean a month. That they could be trained. Now then, let's go back and, and, and kind of go back into that, that hour that they have. How much of that hour is them eating a snack? How much of that hour is them doing a craft? How much of that hour is them running to the bathroom? Do you see what I'm saying? When we train up a child the way it should go, it's the parent's responsibility away from the church in their home to train them up in the way they say they should go. You know why there are so many hands that says there's not? Because if I said, how many people in here came to Christ after the age of 20, it would probably be like the same one. Why? Because we have not went and read this word and put it inside of our heart and said, you know what? I see what that verse says. I have a huge responsibility to share my, tell my kids what God's word says. And I'm going to give you this one right here for free. One of the thing, two of the things that are detrimental that I see, and, and it has started in my generation of, of, of a thing called an Atari. Who in here had an Atari 2600? Hey, it's a bunch of us, right? That was the first gaming system that, that they came out with. Now, if you if you was born in the, in the 90s, you probably don't know what an Atari 2600 is. That was an 80s kid, kid toy right there. You got it at Christmas. And it was kind of expensive for the time, and you had to buy those games that popped in the top, and they looked like a big cartridge. And now everything's on a disc, okay? But... My mom brought that thing to my house the other day. She says, I'm cleaning out a closet. I don't want this anymore. So she put it on my table and it's still sitting there. I don't know what to do with it. You know why? I never got engulfed in the video game world. But if I'm training up a child in a way that they should go, what's maybe the first thing that I want to teach my children? What's something that they learn? It's very elementary and they learn it when they're young. It's called the ten what? Wow, that's awesome. Is that something that you want your kids to know? Is it, am, I, am I hearing that everybody in here, if you have a child, you would love for them to know the Ten Commandments? Okay? What about follow the Ten Commandments? When we train our child up in a way it should go, and when we get to those Ten Commandments, and it says, Thou shalt not kill. Why do we put a game in their hand that lets them go kill? Bless the Lord. And why do we want our kids to know that there shall not be any other gods before me? Should we put a, something in front of them that should totally engulf them in their adulthood that they do not even can't even function, much less know who Jesus is? Bless the Lord. This is a huge problem. Yes. Huge problem because most of the, I'm not saying all video games are awful. But if you're stealing cars, breaking the speed limit, and killing folks, you don't need them in your house. Amen. And I'm not saying that because I don't have them in mind. I'm saying that because God's Word wants us to be holy. And if we're going to train up our child in the way they should go, those things are not to be in it. That was my first. This is my second. I'm going to give it to you this one for free too. And training up a child in the way it should go. Please watch what they watch. Amen. Bless you, Lord. And if you can't watch it, they sure don't need to watch it. Amen. If they can't watch it, you don't need to be watching it. Amen. Why? Yeah, you watch them movies. Why can't I? Mama, you watch that. Why can't I? Stay in the bedroom back there. I'm going to watch my movies. Anybody ever done that? Oh, the kids are gone this weekend. We can go rent some movies. Bless you, Lord. Do you see what you're putting inside of you? And you want to train up your child the way they should go. And when they're older, they won't depart from it. 
Guess what? What happened to you? Do you see what being a part from God's Word has done to our world? God, God wants us to be so with Him and so in tune to what He wants in our life that He's willing to send His one and only Son to die on the cross for those sins to so even in us now. Do you see the, the price that He paid for that? And every time we choose something that's apart from Him, we're saying, we don't want what you want, I want what I want. This crossroad that we're at, either you're going to choose it with your mind with a worldly view or a heavenly view. And I'm praying for the heavenly view. Let's get back right here. Timothy had been raised up so he knew uh, he was, and, and he knew he, who he was, and he was familiar. Uh, it was familiar for him to make godly decisions. Can you imagine you raised up your child the way he should go, and then they were making godly decisions before they even talked to you? Do you know what that is? I believe that's a parent's greatest win. It's when you see your child <coughs> acting godly. Amen. You didn't tell him to. I want you to feel the weight of being apart from God's Word in this crossroads that we're in. Because being apart from God's Word, we really struggle. More than you even know. You know why? Because we've got used to struggling so much that a little bit of a struggle is okay. We think, ooh, we've got a little bit of struggle. You ain't supposed to be struggling at all in God's Word. Amen. Bless the Lord. There's not even supposed to be worry. Do you know what you replace worry with? Prayer. Amen. <clears throat> Folks that don't make good decisions have an identity crisis. Bless the Lord. I see young folks today just making decisions. I ain't even got to ask them a question. I walk up, I see them, I see them act and do things at the ball game, at the mall, at the Walmart, or whatever, and you can tell by their actions that they have an identity crisis. Let me give you an example. If a kid is acting real cocky and he's better than everybody else, he don't know who he is. He's hunting an identity. There's something he's searching for, he or she is searching for, and they have not found it, because if they did, they sure would be acting like that. When they use foul language, they think that that language makes them feel big. All it does is show how small their mind really is. It shows how immature they are rather than speaking wisdom and being mature. This is what happens when we get away from God's Word. I see this, and it just it, it burdens me. It burdens me so bad because you see that there's so many kids outside, even in our church, that they have an identity crisis and they do not know who they are. Why do they not know who they are? They trusted Jesus. <laughs> the very one of the very first things that I see of, of children nowadays, and I hey, I'm not just saying children. I'm gonna go home and jump up on in adults on this one. Bless the Lord. Is they have no authority in their life. You can tell by the decisions that they make and the way that they speak to people. There's no reverence. There's no respect. When you have an authority in your life, guess what you do? You reference that authority. When, when you spend quiet time in God's Word and, and you, you meditate on God's Word, He is refining you. He is getting out the, out the guck out of your life and the garbage and He's taking it out and He is pouring Himself in. And when He does that, it so transforms you, like Romans 12 2 says, be no longer conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you can know what to do and do it. Amen. That's what is acceptable. 
totally to God. So when, when, when I see the kids that are like that, and even adults, that they just want to just... One of the hardest things it is is to tell somebody, I'm a preacher. Bless you, Lord. It is. You know why? Because the mood changes instantly. It's like I came to condemn them instead of love them. If they knew what the Word of God says, that He didn't come to condemn, that He came to seek to save that which was lost, that He didn't come to condemn, that He came to love, they would be wanting everybody that knows Jesus to talk to them. You know why? They're unloved. Most of the time, people act out because they feel unloved, unwanted. There's something that's happened in them that they just don't feel like they need to be who they are. The world owes them something. So we need to know our designation. We need to know who we are. And, and Timothy, as he was here, uh, he knew who he was because of these scriptures that was put into him when he was young. And he came to faith in Christ. And when he came to faith in Christ, someone recognized it and said, Hey, I want to carry you under my wings. Yes. People that act out and do all those things are just mimicking what they've already seen from somebody else. Where do you think those children get those attitudes from? Where do you think the, the adults get their attitudes and ways from? It's a learned behavior from parents and family. It's an environment that, that it has, has happened. Now, I'm not saying every time, I'm not saying 100% now, let me go back to that 99.99%, that there is some that make it out. There is some that if you've seen that child, you would no way expect their family to look like that. Or, if you've seen that child acting out in a way that's wrong, you would by no means think that their family was holy. A child of God acts like God's child. Amen. You know, this is, this is something that, that, that is a hard pill to swallow nowadays because we want to be so loving. And we don't want to be judgmental. And whenever we read God's Word and, and, and I say it like that, it seems like I'm telling people and I'm putting a, a, a label on them that, that a, a child of God acts like God's child. But you know what? That is very true. And it's not that I'm judging because I can't judge. I am only a messenger of what this Word says. And if you look, at John 1, 12 and 13, it says, But as many as received Him, to them He gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in His name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. But as many as has received Him, to them He gave them the right to become children of God. So if you ain't trusting Jesus... Who's your father? Bless him, Lord. People say, well, I was just created. I don't belong to nobody. Yeah. Oh, you it says, you, you're the devils. Are you gods? And, and I, hey, I, I didn't leave it out. John 8. 37 through 38, and you go all the way down to about 47, but I chose these two. It says, I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me. Now Jesus was talking here to these uh, uh, Pharisees, and, and they were better than him, and said, hey, we're Abraham's descendants. We're the holy people. You're not. And he has said, I know you that, that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me, because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. Jesus Himself was talking to the people at the church saying, you don't know my father. And they're saying, yes, my father's Abraham. And He says, that's a good father, but if, you was, if he was your father, you'd be acting like me and agreeing with me. And you're not. A child of the devil acts like the devil. And the third one here says, know your direction. Not only do we need to 
uh, uh, know our destination and know your designation, but you need to know your direction. God's Word is our road. You know, when I traveled, I traveled on the road from about 1993 to about 1999. So about six years, I was on the road. I, knew, I didn't even have to have an atlas after about three years. I knew where everything was all over the southeast. But I had this atlas, and before I went on a trip, uh, my, my first real trip that I remember that uh, my boss man couldn't find me. We didn't have cell phones at that time in 1993. And I was in Broussard, Louisiana. You ever been to Broussard, Louisiana? It is a hole in the wall place. And it's a little above every island where they make that tobacco sauce. So I was down in Broussard, Louisiana. And I, and I was having to find on the map where this place was. Well, I was just from Poto, from, from Webster's Chapel. And I was headed to Broussard, Louisiana. Well, it took me yeah, all day to get there. And I was like, man, I'm by myself, I pulled into town, see the big side, welcome to Broussard. And I don't know if that was good or bad. So I got in there in the town, found me a hotel to stay in, checked in. Well, the next morning, my boss man of that area was supposed to call me. He said, when you get there, you remember pagers? These little pages, little square thing you have, you hit that buzz, and a number would pop up, and you'd call it back. Well, he, I had his pager number, and I paged him and told him my number at, at the hotel. Well, the next morning, he didn't have his pager. His nephew had his pager. He was, and he was having surgery that day. Well, the nephew didn't know I was supposed to pay you. He has a fit. And next thing I know, I called Atlanta and tell them, my big boss man, where I'm at. And he's like, well, they can't find you. I said, I'm sitting in Broussard, Louisiana. I said, it's not that big of a place. I said, he got about five cars. Just look at the one with the Alabama tag. <laughs> So finally he found me and he had it, he had come apart because it was about eight, nine o'clock before he found me in that hotel. I didn't know where to go. But I had this atlas since it was in my car for years. And that atlas carried me places that I didn't know where I needed to go. It showed me shortcuts, it showed me exit numbers, it gave me everything that I needed to know of a direction and a way to safely get to my, my destination. Do you know what we've been given today that does the exact same thing? It's the Holy Word of God that's sitting in your life. This Word right here will take you anywhere that you need to go. It will show you and minister to you how you need to be ministered. This Word right here will, 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 will show you who Jesus is. And reveal the things of God has done in this place. Why would we not want that? Why would I not choose what God has given to me that's the best thing for me? Why would I have? A, why would I choose anything else? You got to know your direction. There's one thing. That, that Jesus did in Mark 1, verse 35. It says He went off to a solitary place and He prayed and spent time with God. How many of us are going off to that solitary place each day? Reading God's Word and praying to Him and listening for Him to speak to us. You know, there's a, there's a word it's called busyness. <coughs> That the devil has got, and it's very effective in people's lives to get them not to be in God's Word. Do you know how busy you got to be? You ain't got to be that busy not to read God's Word. You ain't got to be that busy at all. How many of us put it in our plan of the day? To say, you know what, I'm going to take this time right here between this time. Nothing's going to interfere with me. Nothing's going to distract me. I'm going to go to this place in my house or this place on my, on my, on my deck or on my patio or, or, or out in the woods. Or if i got to go sit in my car during my lunch hour. I'm going to spend time with God and that's what time that's going to be. And every day I'm going to do it. Bless you, Lord. 
This is how we know your. This is how you know your direction. Yes. That atlas done me no good under the seat. It done me no good to keep it in the trunk. The only time that atlas would ever do me any good is if I got it out and I opened it up and I started finding where I was and I knew where I needed to go. Yes, and then I could draw a line. You know what's amazing about those GPSs? It always knows where I'm at. The thing is, where do I need to go? I gotta punch that in. So you know what? It's up to me to know my destination. It's up to each one of us to know our eternal destination. 1 John 5.13 says, I've written these things that you may know you have eternal life. If we do not know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we know we're going to spend eternity in heaven, there's not any comfort in that. You know, and, and we, we want to take the world view here. I'm going to go this world view. If you go to church long enough, you get your name on the road, and you're in heaven. If your daddy was a pastor, your daddy was a deacon, or he led a song service, or he thought Sunday's good, man, I must be good too. Those things are works. Those things are works. And in Ephesians 2 8 and 9 it says, For by grace we are saved through faith. Amen. It's not of works. It's the gift of God. Amen. It's something that He gives us with because of what He did on the cross. Amen. That we can go to heaven. But just as I said just a minute ago in that John 1 12 about a child of God acts like God's child, we must receive Him. If not, it's the same as James 2.19 that says, uh, 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 even the demons believe and they tremble. Yes. They believe who Jesus is, but they ain't received in Him. They ain't said, Jesus, I want You in my life. And you know how you tell Him you want Him in your life every day? You go to where He's at. Amen. The very letter that He wrote to us is a love letter to us to have our roadmap of how I need to live and what what this right here, it, it, these words will heal your heart. These words right here will, will deter you from making a wrong decision. These words right here will point you to love one another. It'll also point you to share your secrets with a friend that you can trust that you may be healed of those things. That's called accountability. Most of us don't want to be accountable to nobody. But we don't want nobody to know we do bad things. Much less tell them. Bless you, Lord. But when we go to God's Word and we start looking and we say, you know what? He's telling this to me. I must not be the only one because He wrote this to everybody. When you start seeing this is written to everybody, you know what? Everything gets kind of leveled off. They ain't these people over here, and these people over here, and these people over here. A quiet time was when Jesus went to a solitary place early in the morning and spent time with God. You can put that down, Mark 135. And also, not just the quiet time that we have, we need to allow time for an understanding through prayer. Jesus taught in parables which was earthly stories with heavenly meanings. Those parables that he, that he said and He taught those parables, the people that He was talking to, they didn't always get the meaning. He would come back to where the disciples were and sometimes He would share the meaning of that parable with them. Yes. You see that in Matthew chapter 13 of the parable of the soul. <coughs> spending time with this Word is spending time with Jesus as He ministers to you to live as He did. We are to follow His commands even today. This Word right here is still relevant. Amen. This Word is relevant. Verse 16, it says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. We must be confident the Word of God is from God Almighty we want to follow it. Amen. If we don't think that this is true, Ain't nobody going to follow. 
But the one thing you got to, you got to put in your mind, how is this world made? Do you know that science has never disproved this? It has lined up with it. There's science books that was here a long time ago, and they've had to throw them away because they have become obsolete. This book is still the same. This book transcends time. You know why? Because it has an author that has transcended and is not even affected by time. The author of this book right here should be the authority in your life. <coughs> and when he is, people will think you're different. Because you won't look worldly anymore. You know, people say, Why? Well, Heard you guys say it. How come you don't ever hang out with me no more? And I want you to know right there, if you got to ask somebody that, you was probably their problem. <laughs> if you go to Genesis chapter 1 and read through the first five verses, and I'm going to do it. Go to Genesis chapter 1 and read the first five verses. It says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. And darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, and it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness He called night. So the evening and morning were the first the very creator of time wrote this book. The very creator. If He created everything that we see, I think He's an authority on everything that we see. And then you've got to go to Revelation chapter 22. All the way from the front, all the way to the back. Revelation 22. 12 through 17. The Bible says, and it's just Jesus talking here in the book of Revelation. It says, And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Verse 14 says, Blessed are those who do His commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves the practices of a lie. With one lie, the devil murdered the whole world. Let that one sink in. That's scriptural. That's John verse, uh, chapter 8. And in verse 16 it says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bride and morning star. Verse 17 says, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him who hears say, Come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Amen. You know what? This is in Revelation. This is after the time. This is everything is over with and done. And this is the end. This is what John saw as a revelation he saw it in an apocalypse. It was this thing that he seen. It was a dream that God showed him. That sure is coinciding with the very first verses of the Bible. That God was in control then, and He's in control at the end. So you have to marry those two together, and you have to say He's always in control. And the one thing that we are is out of control. You know why? Because we have to live in this fallen world and we're fallen man. And being fallen in this fallen world, we have to put up with things that God didn't want us to have to put up with. 
But because of the choices of man, we are now having to live in the middle of what God really didn't want to live in. But God fixed that problem through His Son, Jesus. The very thing that sin was chosen and then we got cast out of the garden, now, by that right there, that we can have the tree of life again, Jesus came so we could go back in the garden. That we can get back to that tree of life. What Adam done in that garden flopped it in a way that God didn't want it. But when Jesus came, He put it back in order. But we must accept what Jesus did. When we accept what Jesus did, we must accept what He has told us to do. What's that greatest commandment that He's given us? Love God while your heart, soul, and mind and your neighbor as yourself. Are we loving like we're supposed to? This week, the past two weeks in our discipleship class, I've asked people, I want you to love on somebody this week and I want you to come back and share it. I had one person last week share it. Are we loving others in a way that points them to Jesus? I would never preach this message if I wasn't loving people to point them to Jesus. I'm showing that this right here is the way, the truth, and the life, and there's no other way unto heaven whereby man must be saved by, only by Jesus Christ. Amen. And if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. Amen. And you won't buy no more lives. The one thing that the devil has done, he's got you to buy the lies. And he's made it for truth. And in your heart of hearts, you know it's a lie. You just don't want to believe you got to it. Spending, a, having, and spending time with God every day in His Word. It does more than you'll ever know. Yes. God wants to talk to you. He wants to, he wants to love on you. And he, he wants to show you His way. Because he, know we, he knows we do not know it. That's why He sent it. Can we be like David and be a man after God's own heart? Or a woman after God's own heart. His heart is that none perish, but all will come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now I talked about that crossroad. We're at this crossroad. And people need to make decisions. These may be some of the decisions you need to make tonight. I need Jesus. Maybe mom and dad told you about Jesus, but you just ran from him. Maybe you lost today and you won't blame somebody else for it. I'm going to that nobody else will blame. You've been deceived. There's a blinder that was on your eyes that you thought that it was true. And all these people that's been hollering and yelling that you're a sinner and you need to be saved, you thought they're all against you. God is for you. He is for you. Then again, there's some people in here that, made it, that are a crossroad of, you know, I've made it this far. I feel like I need to go back and go back to what I used to be. And I'm going to tell you, you need to come and let it stuff that Jesus wants to do. And make a godly, heavenly choice. Don't make the world a choice. That's what got you in the place that you're in. There's a decision that you need to make tonight. If you're at that crossroad, I pray that you choose the right way. The straight way. The Bible talks of two ways. One is the broad way, the broad gate. And there's many that find it. That's the way that a lot of the whole world is probably going to be going in because it's the right and the end thing to do. But then it says there's a narrow gate, there's a narrow way. This narrow gate, it says it's few to find. That burden is hard. This gate, this narrow gate has been swung open wide for you. But don't, don't, don't misunderstand this narrow gate. 
On the other side, it's still a narrow way. You don't open up and say, hey, I got Jesus now. I can live like I want to and go wide. There is a narrow way that He wants you to follow. He who has my commands and obeys them, they are the ones that love me. What do you do with Jesus? Let's pray.